in a universe, full of ideas. We draw, likeness, from the dark, to a place where opposites attract. Right meets left, positive touches negative, sparking an explosion of truth. Because politics makes, strange bedfellows. I wanted to dig in a little bit to the past and uh, talk about your political work. You know, you've been, ever since you were in college, you've been very politically active and you have a, a really fascinating background in politics. I know at one time, uh, it's okay, when we're young, we all make mistakes, but at one time you were a Democrat yes. <laughs> and uh, you used to be Deputy Director of Voter Protection on uh, Terry McAuliffe's gubernatorial campaign, and and then you worked on uh, Senator John Kerry's PAC. Um, what was that like? Well, those are the experiences that convinced me to become an independent. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, um, you know, coming out of uh, college, um, I really wanted to help make some kind of positive change in our society and in the United States, because I thought there's so many kind of obvious solutions and things that should be done that people agree on, you know, across the political spectrum that aren't done, like ending the wars and putting that money, you know, kind of back into infrastructure or taking it off taxes or whatever. Um, and so, you know, I thought naively that the Democratic Party could be like a venue to do that. Uh, and so I got involved with them. I worked uh, on various campaigns and um, and and on Kerry's PAC and uh, and then on Bernie Sanders presidential campaign in 2016, uh, where I was the national political outreach coordinator, uh, reaching out to the superdelegates uh, for him, trying to win Good their luck. support. Yeah, exactly. It was miserable. It was miserable. Um, and then uh, uh, and then also. Uh, doing some delegate work at the convention, helping to arrange his political meetings, things like that. Uh, and then he asked me to come over to uh, Our Revolution. So I helped found Our Revolution with him uh, after that as well. But uh, that whole experience of how they cheated Bernie in the primary was kind of what uh, uh, what told me uh, that that party couldn't be reformed. Hmm. You know, I have to ask, because you were there at the convention in 2016. And... I know that Bernie's supporters were not really happy about this uh, nomination of Clinton by acclamation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, how did that feel for you who had worked so hard to help Bernie get to that convention, to bring all those delegates only to have Bernie tell everyone to sit down, shut up, just endorse Hillary. It's all good. What was that like? It was terrible. It was very dispiriting. In fact, I remember that very moment that you were talking about. I, I was on the convention hall um, because, you know, I, I didn't even know he was going to do that. And mm -hmm. so I was on the convention hall when he, you know, came up, did it by acclamation. Um, and, uh, you know, it just went so, so much further beyond that, too. It was real. It was a real slap in the face of the Bernie delegates uh, and people who had worked so, so hard for him, like across the country. You know, just so many unbelievable stories of sacrifice of people sending in their Social Security checks or skipping like, you know, there were even some stories of people who like skip, you know, funerals, like, you know, to be there uh, or to, to volunteer during GOTV and that kind of thing. Um, but it went even beyond that because, I mean, his uh, um, since I was, you know, I was there with the team, um, Bernie was sending text messages to uh the delegates uh in the convention hall that were literally coming straight from the clinton campaign they were they were written by robbie mook and they were sent to jeff weaver and jeff weaver would send them out to all the delegates in bernie's name and of course they were calm down settle down support clinton you know it's it such a travesty of of an affair he really should have gone independent and i encouraged him to go independent i encouraged him to take the top of the ticket in the green party which jill stein offered him but mm -hmm. he didn't want to do that I remember. And, you know, I, I remember that moment, too. I wasn't in the house, but I was watching on television. And I could see that 
you know, a lot of the Bernie delegates were getting rowdy and I was expecting a walkout in protest, but Bernie managed to get them under control. Now, after hearing from you, I understand who was really behind that. It was Robbie Mook and, of course, the Clintons. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they had one glorious moment where they stormed the media tent. Mm-hmm. Uh, they kind of misdirected. Uh, they made it seem like they were going to walk out, but they actually went to the media tent. And it was it was a good idea because it was captured by all the press there, mm-hmm. uh, what they were doing. But the DNC had all kinds of shenanigans. They were kicking the Bernie delegates out. They were... They had seat fillers coming in. They were turning off the lights to block the banners and stuff. You know, it was, um, yeah, it it, it was terrible. It was an awful, awful production. It was. And yet (laughs) what amazes me is that when Bernie ran again, four years later, a lot of people came back for more abuse. They, they (laughs) came back for another round with Bernie thinking that it was going to be different this time. Can you make that make sense? You know, that was, that was, that gets to the foundation of um, the People's Party, actually, is that it was born out of a split in the Mm -hmm. Bernie camp um, where we represented as the People's Party draft Bernie, um, the kind of group of those Bernie supporters that didn't believe that the Democratic Party could be reformed. We just watched the DNC you know, uh, rig the, the the process in the WikiLeaks revelations and everything. And of course, then we saw the DNC fraud lawsuit, you know. Mm-hmm. And so we said, Bernie, you know, love you, but this party can't be saved. You know, instead, you should come out and you should, you know, you should run. Um, you should run independent, run again in 2020, but run as independent. And so, you know, we um, in that kind of first phase of what we did, uh, we organized as draft Bernie for a people's party. The idea being, come on, Bernie, come out here and join us instead. And let's start a new party in this country. The new party that like 60% of Americans wanted back then. Now it's 70. Right. And, um, and, you know, run again. And with all those 13 million, uh, people who you had vote for you in the primary and the $240 million that you raised, you know, and your massive email list and everything, we can do this. We can get it done. We can get nationwide ballot access you can run and you can really take on the two parties. Um, And, you know, there was an article I wrote in the Huffington Post at the time that was the very beginning of Draft Bernie where I suggested that that happen. Um, And there was such a surge of support um, for that. Uh, But, you know, and and then it kind of culminated, Draft Bernie kind of culminated in the um, Convergence Conference, uh, which was a conference that we hosted with bunch of allies, lots of people who are supporting draft Bernie, uh, to get him to break with the Democrats finally. And it was at American university law school. And, uh, uh, we had the draft Bernie town hall where we invited Bernie to hear from us, hear from all of our, you know, supporters. There were hundreds of people there. Um, Jimmy Dore, Cornell West and Shama Sawant, uh, were hosting the uh, town hall with me and Bernie stood us all up. Bernie stood us up and I remember uh, that. he didn't, didn't even want to talk to us. Um, and it was so disappointing, but you know, uh, look at, I mean, look at him now. So, right. you know, that's just what the democratic party does to people. Yes. And since, you know, I'm working with the Kennedy campaign, Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s campaign and, and he's running in the democratic party, <laughs> despite <laughs> all of our advice not to, Um, He is, uh, you know, he's on a mission to try and save the Democratic Party. Now, I think that's an admirable mission. I would like to uh, have our Kennedy Democrat values return to that party. But you know firsthand what an uphill battle that's going to be because you went through it all with the Bernie campaign. And so um, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about that. And what you think Kennedy will face in terms of opposition from the Democratic Party based on your experience with Bernie? Yeah, no, I mean, gosh, so many things. I see it now. It's, um, it was the, uh, the superdelegates, of course, are kind of, they have multiple lines of defense, you know. Uh, there's, uh, of course, there's no debates this time. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure they're going to stick to that and, you know, because they don't, 
they're terrified of putting uh, Biden on a stage with with Kennedy or Williamson. And, um, you know, then they've reshuffled the primary debate order, of course, they put South Carolina first. So that that's kind of going beyond what they even did to Bernie. Uh, yeah. They're, you know, they're, they're taking new inventing new ways to rig it. And of course, how did that come to be? Uh, and why South Carolina? Why are they putting South Carolina in front of Iowa? Because you know why? Yeah, exactly. Because that's the state where Biden thinks that he just owns the black vote. Mm -hmm. And so he thinks he's going to go waltz in there and they're going to give it to him the first state. And that's going to set the tone for the rest of the primaries, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and, of and, you course, know, uh, Kennedy just spent the last two weeks campaigning hard at, all across South Carolina, drawing big crowds. Um, but something that kind of troubles me is when I look at these crowds, they're 95 percent white. And I don't understand why we're not seeing more black faces in those crowds, because the Kennedys and the black community have been, you know, some of their heroes. They're like gods in parts of this country, certainly down in the south. Uh, they've got a picture of Jesus over the fireplace, MLK on one side and John F. Kennedy on the other um, as the Holy Trinity in, uh, in much of Southern Black America. So I, for the life of me, Nick, I can't figure out what Bobby needs to do to bring the Black voters over to his side, away from Joe Biden. What the hell has Joe Biden done for Black America? Oh, my God. What Ever. hasn't he done to them? Exactly. I mean, this is, <laughs> this is like, you know... Uh, uh, I mean, he's a basically like a Jim Crow segregationist, you know, like mm -hmm. those are his political roots, yeah. uh, author of, you know, uh, uh, and massive advocate of, uh, uh, you know, the crime bill, uh, he in the nineties. He wrote the damn bill to quote Bernie. He wrote the damn bill. Exactly. So it, it, it's hard to think of someone like in American politics who is worse, who has done more to harm black people. Mm -hmm. and people of color um, than Joe Biden. But, you know, in South Carolina and through a lot of the South, you know, a lot of the politics, especially in black communities, it works through those institutions where, you know, people gather through churches, networks of churches, um, which the Democratic Party, you know, works very hard to retain this kind of tight control. Mm, good over. point. Good point. Yeah. Mm. So what I hope he's able uh, to break through. I do too. What about um, something I've heard you talk about over the years uh, with Jimmy Dore? Um, it, you know, in, when you were in that transition back in 2017, 2018, when you were doing our revolution and then the movement for the People's Party, you talked a lot about sabotage of the Bernie campaign from within. Um, yeah. I, I have similar concerns about the Kennedy campaign, to be honest with you. Um, I won't go into detail or name names, but I have some concerns. So tell me a little bit about how that happened and what happened. Well, the way it happened and the thing to look out for, you know, I hope you're listening, Bobby and Dennis and everybody else, <laughs> is um, the DNC will plant people in your campaign. They will send people who worked for either the DNC or some consulting firm, you know, um, into the campaign. They'll kind of advise that this person be hired or the person will approach the campaign. And that person has relationships, you know, often strong relationships back to the party apparatus. Mm -hmm. um, and so those people will then um, feed information, uh, you know, back um, to the party, which, you know, the party can use, of course, to try to sabotage the campaign. And we absolutely had moles in the Bernie 2016 campaign. Um, you know, it was well known by the end. Um, and so it, it is definitely something to look out for. You have to, I think in building a team, this is always a dilemma. Um, you know, because a lot of the, including for us at the people's party, uh, because a lot of the experience, especially professional campaign experience, exists in the world of mainstream establishment democratic politics or Republican politics. And so when you're looking for experienced staff and experience, you know, and professionalism and knowledge, it does, it makes a big difference. 
um, you know, it's hard to find those people who uh, have this, who, who share your viewpoints, you know, and have not worked for all these different candidates or, you know, who are willing to break from them. But that's what you have to look for. You have to look for people who you know and feel very assured are very strongly in favor of the kind of change that you represent and are not what I call the political mercenaries. The Bernie's campaign was divided between the political mercenaries who are the people who would be working any campaign. In fact, most of them would have rather have been working on Clinton's campaign. Mm -hmm. And then there was kind of the, the true believers. Then there was the people who were there for the cause and everything. You got to avoid the political mercenaries because those people will cut your throat. They don't, they don't represent you. They'll, they're opportunists. They'll sell you out. They're just doing it for a buck. You know, that is exactly right. And, you know, besides the DNC moles that work their way into these campaigns, I would be remiss not to mention the intelligence community moles who also work their way into political campaigns. And uh, this I can talk about publicly because it's public knowledge and Bobby himself has talked about it. Um, and this doesn't have anything to do with our staff at, at the Kennedy 24 campaign. But uh, something that's of great concern to me and to others is, uh, you know, the coziness that uh, exists between Bobby Kennedy and uh, the intelligence community. Of course, his daughter-in-law, Amaryllis Fox, who's married to his son, Robert Kennedy III, uh, former CIA agent, spent many years with the agency. Now, of course, she's one of those who says, oh, I left the CIA and now I'm not, you know, supporting the CIA. But does anyone ever really leave the CIA? Hmm. Does anyone ever really leave the DNC? Do their loyalties really change? Those are the questions we need to be asking. This has been a Maverick Multimedia Productions.